On the 10th day of October, Halloween gave to me 10 ghostly hitchhikers, 9 basement clowns, 8 vampire cruises, 7 silent heroes, 6 prequel bloodstones, 5 diabolical fledglings, 4 vampire pianists, 3 dead professors, 2 Michelle actresses, and a radu drooling something bloody. Hey everyone, welcome back to the 10th day of the 31 days of Halloween. I am very excited to be with you today because we are more than halfway through the Hell House LLC series. Uh, as uh, those of you who have been listening to the whole thing know, we're doing a couple of runs this, uh, th this time around of horror movie franchises. And there are three of these so far. There's a fourth one coming out at the end of the month, but I'm not going to have time to do that as part of the 31 days of Halloween. But I did want to go back and look at all the Hell House LLC movies because I have a lot of fondness for the first one. And I think a lot of people do. The problem is when you get into the sequels. And so of course today we are looking at Hell House LLC 2, The Abaddon Hotel, uh, also written and directed by Stephen Cognetti, who has written and directed all of these movies. Uh, so it is a singular vision. You have to give it that, that whatever else you say about the Hell House LLC series, and we will say several things, that this is definitely the work of someone who had a plan. And according to Cognetti himself, he had a plan for a trilogy from Jump. Now, how the fourth film figures into that, your guess is as good as mine, but he definitely had a vision. In this movie does a lot of setup for the third one. And uh, it starts off, let's just get <laughs> into what happens. And I'm going to try to piece this together as best I can with the help of my old pal, Wikipedia, which I have opened in another window because it is hard to get all of the pieces of this right. Because the movie has... A lot of different fragments. It jumps around in time quite a bit. And so rather than take a bunch of notes, which, you know, is what somebody more reliable would do. But also, do you want to spend your life making notes about Hell House 2, uh, the Abaddon Hotel? Is that where you want to be as a person in the world is sitting there with pad and paper? Like, well, let me make sure I've got this chronology right. When the good people at Wikipedia have done this work for you already, is that lazy or is it just using the tools that God has granted us? I would argue the latter uh, and also against the existence of a sentient God. But that's a different story. In Hell House uh, LLC 2, the Abaddon Hotel, we start with this video of and it's documentary style again because it's a mother saying like hey my son went into the abaddon hotel and here is this footage that i could never watch where you see him being uh you know like in the dark chased around by these dark hooded figures that we saw at the end of the first movie and in a, a really creepy moment he it says, like, I went into the dining room and they were all there. They never left and they have no eyes. And then you see these text messages that got sent from uh, the guy to his mother that repeats they have no eyes over and over and over and over again. Which is pretty creepy. That's pretty good. And he disappears. Nobody knows where this guy has gotten to. And then you cut to a morning mysteries panel show where the host of the show is uh, telling you like, Hey, um, the Diane reporter from the first movie is missing and we're doing a report about that. We've got three people on the show today. One of them is this guy, Mitchell, who was one of the documentarians working on the film in part one. He was one of the guys that discovered the found footage or, you know, that Sarah brought the found footage to. And he was the one who discovered that, you know, Sarah is actually dead and try to get in touch with Diane. 
But of course she disappears in room 2C and he is the, hey, Hell House LLC is real. That the documentary that you saw, the documentary being the first movie, that all of that was real. With him on the panel is a guy named Brock Davies. And Brock Davies is, you know, one of those television spiritualist types, the ghost hunter type of, I'm going to go into a haunted place and provoke the spirit and, and so forth. And he's doing this purely as advertising. You can kind of tell he's a little bit of a huckster and is using this whole Abaddon Hotel business to, you know, get some views on his website or promote himself. And, uh, and, and in fact, he's promoting some new thing he's doing. And Susie McCombs, the uh, lady who is running this panel show, cuts him off at one point, which I like. That's pretty fun. And then you've got Arnold Tasselman, who is like a city councilman or something. And he is saying like, hey, all of this Abaddon Hotel business is garbage. It's not true. What happened on you know, October 8th, when the uh, original movie's climax takes place, that all of that was a big accident, that there was some sort of mechanical issue or something just went wrong with the performance itself that resulted in uh, the deaths and disappearance of, of these people. And that basically all of this Abaddon Hotel business is doing damage to the town. And at one point he says like, look, this is not a rich town and we have to spend money we don't have, you know, protecting the hotel, keeping people out of it and trying to debunk this stuff when it comes up, which is pretty good. And then you have <laughs> alongside this Jessica Fox and her team, which is Molly and a couple of other people. Molly, I can't remember the guys. It doesn't really matter because they're kind of incidental. And they're a team of investigative journalists who are watching this call in program, the morning mysteries thing. And they're saying, Hey, um, we need to get involved in this because the town is covering something up. We have proof. We got sent something that shows us that there is uh, more going on here than meets the eye. And so they basically strong arm Mitchell, the documentarian, into meeting them. And the thing I really like about this is that Mitchell approaches this like the Abaddon Hotel is incredibly dangerous. We need to go in. The, if we're going to go in there, we need to go in. We need to get out very quickly. We need to leave somebody outside who can call for help if we need them. Which it turns out is Molly because Molly is is freaked out by the whole uh, Abaddon Hotel business. And they're going in because they think they can retrieve tapes that were found in the refrigerator down in the basement. That the police searched everything, but they didn't search this for some reason. And it's, they kind of wave that away with like, this is a small town police force and they just didn't investigate this the way that they should have. And uh, so we're going in to get those tapes. By the way, all of this, all of this is um, predicated on the idea that there is this rich dude who is uh, like ha has been sent this trove of tapes and he's the one assembling all of this as one big documentary that the morning show the stuff you saw at the beginning, them going down to get the tapes out of the uh, basement refrigerator. All of this is one documentary that is being presented by this rich dude that we don't see in this movie, but has purchased uh, all of the these tapes and, and is assembling all of this. And there's also another like interstitial here where we cut away from all of these people just to do a random spooky moment, which is not the best executed, but it's maybe my favorite thing in the movie as a whole, because it, it's relying on an old urban legend ghost story. And the thing is, uh, two guys are coming back from, you know, some concert or event or something. And there's a, a young woman out in the rain hitchhiking and they stop because they're like, Hey, it's really shitty out today. Let's try to help her out. They stop. She gets in the car 
And they're like, hey, where are you going? And she says, the Abaddon Hotel. And they're like, hey, that's been closed for a few years, but I guess we'll take you there. And she's like, I checked in on October 8th. And they're like, it's September. And she's like, just take me there. And she doesn't say anything. She looks kind of pale and, and creepy. And anyone who has ever seen a horror movie or heard a ghost story around a campfire knows that she is a go 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 ghost but they not only take her to the Abaddon Hotel, they follow her, follow her inside, and then she is, you know, immediately revealed to be a g -g -g ghost, and these two people have also disappeared. So, eh, whatever. And she was one of the people that disappeared the night of October 8th. She was one of the people that was coming through on the tour who has since disappeared. And then we get, uh, we're jumping around in time so much, it just, it breaks my brain. Then you see Jessica Fox, the reporter, being interviewed by the police. And she's all bloody and fucked up. And the police are asking her where she's been and what's happened. And she's like, I don't know. I don't remember. And uh, she's real somber about the whole affair. And they're trying to coax out of her the story of what happened. And so then we go back to the footage of them going into the Ebanon Hotel, where as soon as they go in, they get they do find, in fact, a bag full of tapes and are heading out again when Molly shows up inside and is like, why the fuck did you guys call me and ask me to come in here? You told me I didn't want to come in. And they're like, we didn't do that. We didn't call you. And she's like, w that's fucked up because you, you definitely called me and said, this will be quicker if you come in and give us a hand. So that's what I did so we can get out of here. And then they realize, of course, that they are now trapped inside the Abaddon Hotel and nobody is outside to call for help. The clown is poised at the door and is looking at them and they can't get out because the door slams shut and locks. And then it's just a mad scramble. Like, then it becomes sort of the end of one of these movies, although there's like 20 minutes left at this point, 20 or 30 minutes left when this goes down and they run around the hotel and they're terrorized by ghosts and the hooded figures and the clowns and everything. And there's, you know, a couple of decent scares here and there, uh, in this, this whole, uh, section of the movie where it's just sort of chaos and whatnot. And they end up finding a refuge in a hotel room, but then Molly ends up going missing from said hotel room, and there's a note on the door saying that Molly is in the basement, come get her if you want. And they go down there and get her out of the clutches of one of the clowns, and uh, then, oh, by the way, the Brock Davies character, just so I don't forget him because he's kind of incidental, he also shows up when they're originally breaking into the house or the hotel, but he kind of goes off with his cameraman to do his own thing where he's doing this Ouija board thing in the uh, dining room and immediately is antagonizing spirits and calling on the spirits. And the next thing you know, sure enough, there is a g -g ghost there with them in the dining room staring at them. And he and his dude are like, all right, we're going to go. And then some nooses drop down because part of the lore of this is that uh, a lot of the original Satanists were found hung in the dining room. And of course, when uh, they're doing the mad dash through the uh, hotel when shit starts to hit the fan, then Mitchell and Susie and Molly and that crew run into the dining room and find Brock and his technician hanging from the ceiling like uh, macabre ornaments on a devilish Christmas tree he says metaphorically uh, or simile-ish anyway simlish that's what I was doing I was doing simlish uh, but so at the end of all of this uh, Molly and Susie are ended up uh, captured by the ghosts of the Abaddon and Mitchell is forced to confront a spirit there who kind of goes on this villain monologue bit. It's like a Bond villain, only a g -g ghost. And it it looks exactly like the, the guy from the panel show, the 
uh, Arnold Tasselman, who reveals himself to instead be uh, not Arnold Tasselman, but uh, Tully, Andrew Tully, the guy that, you know, owned the hotel and was doing satanic shit in the first place that uh, the first movie obliquely references, but here he's an actual character. And we know that he's a g g ghost because uh, after he leaves the studio for the, like Susie and the Mystery Mornings or Morning Mysteries, that she gets a call and the real Arnold Tasselman is like, hey, I got into a car accident and I was dealing with police and insurance and stuff and I didn't have time to call you, but I'm calling you now to say, I'm sorry I missed the show. And they're like, the fuck are you talking about? We just recorded a show with you. And that's when you realize like, oh, that Arnold Tasselman is actually... Andrew Tully, the guy who is the the ghost of the Abaddon Hotel, or the central figure of the Abaddon Hotel, who explains to him, like, hey, the Abaddon Hotel never closed. We simply had a grand relaunch when we all committed suicide here, because now we serve our dark master, and there's a lake of fire that we are throwing souls into, and we are constantly reaching out like we're the ones inviting people to the hotel and sending out tapes and we know that just a little bit of intrigue is enough to bring people to us and we're you know ginning up this mystique around the hotel so that more people will come and that will of course feed more souls into the lake of fire for their master and he says you've got to choose somebody who is going to walk out of this hotel and one presumes he picks Susie because, hey, we've seen her periodically looking fucked up and talking to the police. But at one point during the interview at the end of this movie, uh, a, a guy walks by the camera and when he walks by the camera in the police station, which is trained on Susie, we're looking at her being, you know, weepy and dirty and, and so forth. Uh, then you see her looking dead and demonic and she tells him after he passes by and she looks just, you know, bloody and fucked up again. And like she was the victim of a, a horrible crime when uh, she tells him at that point, Hey, you need to go to the Abaddon hotel and check it out. You should really go. And that is sort of the end of the movie is we expand the lore that, hey, there's, you know, the, this central figure, this Andrew Tully figure that we didn't really see before, or if we did, certainly not in this way, who is luring more and more people to the hotel so they can feed them to hell, essentially. And uh, that, you know, ghosts are forever trying to get people to come to the Abaddon. And that is where we leave Hell House 2 uh, to be picked up in Hell House 3, where we get the end of our trilogy. But let's talk about what works and what doesn't work in this movie. And and I think what works is the little bits and bobs where it's not trying to expand the lore so much, but is instead just being a creepy found footage movie. And sometimes that works really well. The first movie is chock full of those moments. This one less so, but like the stuff with the hitchhiker and... Brad Davies in the dining room with his guy and the guy at the beginning of the movie trying to call his mom. Um, all of that stuff is pretty good and pretty entertaining. It's when you get into all of the documentary crew, investigative journalist stuff, the morning panel, that things start to fall apart. And, and things start to fall apart, I think, for a couple of reasons. Reason number one, I think that it's overcomplicating something that ought to be simple. One of the things that we talked about with Hell House, uh, LLC, the original one, is that it's very simple, it's very stripped down, it's just, hey, here are some people putting on a haunt inside this house, and things go sideways because it's actually haunted. That's all you need to know, and there's enough nods towards the background of the place to explain what's going on, but it doesn't get lore-heavy. This movie is super lore heavy. For a movie that's under 90 minutes, it feels kind of long. And there's a lot of, you know, jumping around in time. The structure of it is not great because you're constantly left 
trying to figure out, okay, where in time am I? And the ef effect may be purposeful. Like, this may be Cognetti trying to disorient the audience. I would argue that is not what you want in a movie where jump scares are your primary form of scare. Because the, the creeping dread style of scare doesn't work for a movie like this. The other reason that this talk show stuff doesn't work as well is the fact that some of the performances in this movie are not great. The first movie is not high art. You know, you're not getting a Pacino level performance from these actors, but it's all pretty good. It's good enough. In this movie, there are a couple of performances that are not good enough. And the first time you cut away to the investigative journalist team of Molly and Susie, those performances are so shaky that it completely takes you out of the movie. And you're, it's like, we're watching regional theater now. And not even good regional theater. I, I, I feel like I'm impugning the good name of regional theater. Well, I mean, this, this feels like a high school production. And that carries through some of the movie. There are just some line deliveries and some performances that are really rotten. And that's unfortunate because if, you know, you're watching a movie that is purported to be real or trying to at least cloak itself in the illusion of reality, you can have a shaky performance if it feels like, oh, well, this is just a regular schmegular person caught on camera and sometimes regular schmegular people don't sound like actors and that's fine but when they're trying to sound like normal regular schmegular people and they sound like people trying to deliver a line that's where you get into trouble and that's what happens in this movie and it's not good and also if i haven't already said so the lore stuff like stop it i just need this movie to be simple i need this movie to be a scare machine and that's what a good found footage movie is it it sets up its premise like Blair Witch using that as the high water mark in some cases, or even Wreck. Wreck is another good example of this where it doesn't bother to get steeped in lore. Even in Wreck 2 and Wreck 3, the, you know, whatever you think of those sequels, I think Wreck 2 is pretty good, Wreck 3 less so, but even in those movies, you, you have established enough lore in the first movie to explain the goings on of the other films. You expand it a little bit, but not make it the centerpiece of your movie. And it feels like Hell House LLC 2 is just trying to build up the lore so it can get to part three, which is also incredibly filled with plot and lore. But we'll get to that tomorrow. Um, yeah, I just feel like this is a movie that gets a little too self-important that the success of Hell House LLC, the wrong lessons were learned from that, which is, hey, the reason this works is because the performances are good enough, it's a simple story, and the scares work. This is like, oh, well, if you thought that was creepy, wait till you hear about all of how the town is dealing with the Abaddon Hotel. And, and there's also some stuff teased that never really comes to fruition, that we spend too much time on about how, you know, we're going to talk about how the, the members of the, the town of Abaddon are, you know, complicit in something larger. And that never really seems to come to anything. And it's, it's just, it's too much and not enough at the same time. It's, it's too much lore, too much world building and not enough just being a scary found footage movie when it's doing that it's still pretty good because Cognetti has a great eye for that and a sense of the rhythm of what those scares need to need to be like, uh, how they need to be constructed. And, and this movie just spends too much time not doing that and doing stuff that I don't give a shit about when I'm watching a movie like this. You know, this is not a, a big budget or even mid range, you know, indie movie about a, a satanic cult where I'm getting pulled into the story and the characters, this is a found footage movie that needs to act like a found footage movie. Don't get bigger than your britches for uh, something like this. And it's frustrating because the first one is so effective and so creepy. And it's easy to recommend that one with, with Hell House LLC 2. It's more like, well, this is a good example of 
what not to take away from the success of your found footage movie. And it's not irredeemable. There are things I really do like about it, and there are things that I enjoy about it. I've seen this movie two or three times now. And there, there's enough to keep me going through it. But it's because I'm, I'm sort of fascinated by it as a movie that does the wrong thing. And, and, and I don't know that that's enough to recommend it. Although, if you've seen Hell House LLC 2, there are certainly way worse found footage movies out there. But this isn't a terribly good one, I would argue. So, enough of that. Uh, we'll get to the conclusion of our Hell House LLC trilogy tomorrow. In the meantime, thank you so much for listening. I hope you have a wonderful Tuesday. Uh, it has turned cool here. And I love the fact that it now starts to feel like fall and autumn and Halloween season, as opposed to just an extension of summer, which it felt like for far too long. So it is starting to feel like Halloween. The, the weather is starting to cooperate. The mornings are dark and misty. I love all of it. And I hope you are enjoying it too. So in the meantime, stay creepy out there, everybody. And I will see you tomorrow for another entry in the 31 days of Halloween. See you then.